Uh, good day, my name is Lenny Murphy. I'm working on another video here uh, with a friend to try to explain why I feel that most hefted types of axes, stone axes from the Americas, were probably actually uh, used with the hand and not hefted at all. Uh, most of the grooved axes that I've studied uh, all have indications to tell me that they're actually what I'd consider a hand tool held in the hands. Uh, and when shortened sometimes were actually modified in different areas so that the thumb could be used in a different way. Uh, to make this fairly quick and easy and not to expend too much time on uh, different time periods and different types of axes, I'm going to try to focus on why I uh, have found microscopic evidence is pretty much self-evident that's telling me that a lot of these grooved axes, I would say between 90% uh, and to 60% of all grooved axes are probably actually handheld and not hefted at all as they appear to be because they are grooved. But when studying the depths of different cavities in the seemingly hefted area, uh, one can find polish and worked out to the point where if it was just chafed back and forth from a rawhide or some kind of a hefting material, you're not obviously going to get polish on the inside of the cavity. You're only going to get it on the surface for the most part. And obviously an Indian isn't going to want something that's moving around the heft and, and not comfortable. And after I'd have to say hundreds of thousands of years of refinement of stone tools and hand tools, they finally evolved it to the point where it actually fits the hand. And the polish and the way that it's worked out is usually associated with the hand hold positions. And there again, the polish in the lower cavities usually is the determining factor which tells you that they were hand held and not hefted. Uh, when we see something with side notches, obviously we just assume something is hefted. But uh, when studied with the microscope and realizing for hundreds of thousands of years they've had hand tools, and why would they all of a sudden just go from a handheld tool to a hefted tool almost overnight? Uh, basically the refinement, I find that the more they are refined, the more it's refined for the hand and not for the hefting. Uh, and that pretty much holds true on all types. Uh, you've got three-quarter grooved axes, fully grooved axes, and a few here on the table are actually half grooved. And I'm sure some of the types, the half grooved types maybe especially, might have been hefted in different ways. Uh, but there again, if you study the polished areas, uh, the cavities within the channeled areas, that can help indicate how it was held and a lot of it is just from the hand. If you can see where the hand was pushing against it, you can see where there's additional polish from the hand, from the fingers. And there again, where it's held in the hand, it's rightly called a hand tool versus something smaller held in the fingers should probably be considered there again a finger tool to give it more distinction. And this particular drill held in all four directions was a very effective finger tool and it fits in the fingers in all directions and it was refined to fit the fingers in all four directions. Uh, there again just kind of quickly tying back into my first video that talks about uh, arrowhead types, uh, different side notch or different different bases but usually the bases are there again for fingers. Uh, there again hundreds of thousands of years of technology that refined into something that looked like it was hefted as well as the axes with many, many thousands of years of technology. Uh, if we look at things without any modern thoughts, basically it can give us real clues to the past. And if we don't assume anything, and we start from basically ground one uh, on reading sort of a new language, uh, I think we can find that we've been looking at these things in a foreign language and thinking they're spoken in English. They just spoke to us, but once you study the details, you'll feel that we've probably been looking at things in a foreign language and they're actually written in English. And once you can 
understand the finger positions, the hand positions, uh, the different polish associated from the hand and the fingers and how they had knocked down the high points on purpose to fit the fingers on, and not just for a simple heft uh, that probably wouldn't have been very effective because they would have loosened up in a fairly quick order uh, when used. And most axes, uh, except for the different types of pounding stones that also have grooves on some of the pounding stones, uh, I think we can <clears throat> start thinking that the women were making the mortars and pestles which we have on the table here. And the women were doing a lot of the work associated with fires and firewood. So I would assume with the refinement that the women have from making stone beads, from making mortars and pestles, I would also think that most of these other working types of tools, uh, not just the pestles, but also the axes were made and used by women for pounding, making red paint, different pigments or what have you. And when they get short and dull like this, uh, it wasn't because the hefting wasn't coming apart on them or uh, it was basically too short to be effective anymore because it wasn't able to be used in all directions anymore because of its shortness. So that's why we find a lot of axes that are short, dull, yet over the extensive period of time they did leave down a lot of polish associated more with the hand. And I think if you study what artifacts you have in your collections, uh, you might find that these are hand tools as well. At this time, I would like to expand a little bit on the thoughts that I was briefly mentioning earlier about the different pestles and different mortars that I would assume, and I think everyone could probably assume, uh, that were made and used by women. Uh, all these hand tools are all been pecked and polished, highly refined to fit the hand on purpose, obviously, uh, not hefted at all, and I don't think anyone would would assume that where they are uh, this type and they fit the hand so well and the polish associated with the fingers and everything I would assume and I think everyone could, could agree that these are handheld tools. And then when you get into a slightly different type this pestle here actually has a bit of a groove around it. There again the groove is really nicely refined for the hand and I don't think it would gain any advantage to have a long handle that they'd have to lift the extra weight and you'd have looseness occur as well. But there again, with hundreds of thousands of years, they slowly over time uh, made things truly to fit the hand. And these are truly hand tools and a lot of times they could have been used in both directions as well. You see a lot of use on both ends depending upon the types of materials that they're grinding and pounding on. Pounding on. But there again, I'm just sort of uh, expanding on the, the facts that probably the woman were really, uh, for many thousands of years, been using hand tools, finger tools, and had been grinding and pecking and polishing and drilling holes and beads, obviously, were probably another woman's uh, trait to, to make the wampum, to start a money system, I guess you would say. And they really developed different technologies that were quite advanced to refine and pack and polish and drill holes and make grooves and different tools to fit the hands. And I would think over time that most of the mortars and pestles, they changed. Some of them were roller pestles as well, they consider a roller pestle. Uh, a lot of the roller pestles types that I've studied actually were not used in the sense of rolling but the finger polish and hand use also associates the hand from being held into the object itself, the artifact itself, and used on both ends, which is where you're getting the polish and the work has been done, refinement on both ends. And I would assume there again for grinding, uh, pounding, and uh, creating flour and different pigments for, for either painting or for cooking. And, and there again, by studying the tool itself, you can see where there hasn't been any, any work done or any polish done other than for the hand and the fingers to do the rolling process. As we have modern rolling pins, we just see these as round and assume that they're rolling pins. But there again, 
a lot of the associated polish and the way they're made, they're made for grinding and pounding and not for rolling per se. So there again, we can't assume just because something has the shape of a modern item that it, that it is uh, or has been used the way that a modern item was used. We have to go back into the past with no thoughts from today and assume nothing and study something for what it has to offer, not what has been imposed upon our thought process as we've grown up in modern times. And I'd like to transfer there a little bit into a, a different type of tool. There again, I still think made ground out, highly polished, and made by the woman and used for women's purposes for grinding. And a lot of these gouges, I would assume, and from what I can feel, uh, they are also handheld, not hefted onto a handle. Uh, hefting would be breaking the tips, cutting edges, and it would be more of a crude tool, but these are highly refined. And you move into a different type of celt, which is just more straight across and not like the gouge, you have several, several types as well. You have the pointed base or more of a square base. And I would say that more of the square base celts were hefted, were put into some kind of a handle. And possibly the same with the pointed ones, but this particular one from Maine actually has a ground out area where the thumb fits and the smaller hand fits really well into the hand. And there again, as these got short, and the problem was is it was coming up against the fingers when they'd get short, uh, a lot of tools would mainly just just, just regarded uh, because they were short and dull, not because uh, they weren't functional anymore. But there again, if that was into a uh, some kind of a mechanical type of handle, it wouldn't have mattered how short it was as long as they had a cutting edge and still could have used it. But there again, if it did have a handle on, I think you'd find that there'd be a lot more damage to a lot of these tips because they would have used them, especially in their smaller stages for cruder, uh, less refined uh, chopping and, and cutting purposes. Uh, I think that probably expands uh, the thought process on grooved axes about as far as I can for now. I don't want to, there again, get into time periods and different types of, of axes and I think just to try to understand how they were used is, is very important and not to assume that they are hefted just because they have a groove. Uh, that's an assumption that really has to be uh, you know, properly evaluated there again. If we think about the past with no thoughts from today, I think we can truly advance archaeology in our own private studies within our own collection as far as what we've found and know that hasn't been uh, doctored up by anybody that uh, you know, has come across it along the way in time. I uh, thank you for your interest and I'm looking forward to doing the next video as well already and hope you can spend some time putting your hand on the stone tools to feel what the realities are uh, on the tools and I'm sure within a short period of time you'll be able to, to pick up these different clues that are left behind for us to understand once we can realize that this is English that we're trying to read and not a foreign language that can't be deciphered.